She told me that when they left there, Christine went back to make sure that mom was dead. It's an emergency. I had a call for four people dead. Probably four victims have been shot. Christine, so listen to me. Listen to me. What did you tell me? Listen to me. He can no longer hurt you. But number two, what did he say? What do you mean he shot them? I didn't mean to hurt them. You didn't mean to hurt them? No. A girl known as Brittany was worried. Her best friend Tiffany wasn't answering the phone. She always answered her phone. It was nearing six o'clock and she was supposed to be meeting up at Tiffany's house. Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. She thought back to the call she had with Tiffany's boyfriend, Marcus. He said she was in the bathroom, but that was three hours ago. Driving up towards the house, she saw Tiffany's car in the driveway. Why wasn't she answering the phone? She knocked on the door. Knocking turned to pounding. Trying the knob, the door was unlocked. A gasp is all that escaped the teen before she screamed. Call the cops. It's an emergency. I had a call for four people dead. Something four victims have been shot. Unbeknownst to them, the shy, quiet girl they befriended was harboring more than they could ever know. Christine Paulilla was born March 31, 1986, on Long Island, New York, to stay-at-home mother Lori and construction worker Charles Paulilla. She was a well-loved, outgoing young girl. But this all changed when Christine turned two. Lori was quieter than usual one evening. Where's daddy? Young Christine asked. He's not coming home. Charles had tragically passed away in a construction accident, killed by falling bricks on a New York high rise. A couple of months later, Christine's grandfather and great grandmother joined her father in the afterlife. Mommy, I don't understand, Christine told her mother one night. Why is it that people I love go away? Heartbroken and unable to deal with the hardships that came with being a single mother, Lori turned to narcotics. Eventually, losing custody of her children, seven-year-old Christine went to live with her grandparents. She didn't really understand. She would call me on the phone and cry, Mommy, can't I come home? Lori explained in an interview with ABC News. By the time Christine was in kindergarten, she developed alopecia, a disorder that causes hair to fall out. She began wearing wigs and drawing on her eyebrows, but was severely bullied for it. Kids would come up behind her and pull her wig off. The young girl's vision was also bad, so she began wearing thick glasses, which only added to the bullying. She wore this red kind of wig and she wore just a ton of makeup. She almost, I hate to say this, but she did look a little bit clownish most of the time. Christine's life eventually took a turn for the better. Her mother had regained custody over her and they went to live with Lori's new husband, Tom Dick, in the affluent suburb of Clear Lake, Houston, Texas. The bullying continued, but she caught the attention of popular girls Rachel Colarudis and Tiffany Rowell. Tiffany was a very fun person. She was always kind of moving and bubbly and, and talkative. When you first saw Rachel Coloradus, she just struck you as this beautiful girl. I mean, she could have been a model. The two beautiful girls were a year older than Christine and immediately took her under their wing, showing her how to wear makeup properly and pick out fashionable wigs. No longer the ugly duckling, everyone began to take notice of Christine's transformation. 
she was even voted Miss Irresistible by her classmates. The girls would spend all their free time together giggling and taking pictures. Christine would even write about her love for the girls in her notebook. According to Lori, Christine really trusted her new friends and a big sign was that she was comfortable not wearing a wig around them. But evil lingered not too far. Whether it was from jealousy or from her rugged past, Christine Paulilla's sunshine didn't last. Christine's relationship with her friends changed when she began hanging out with Chris Snyder, an older boy who she had previously hooked up with in junior high. Chris was tall, had ocean blue eyes and a goatee. Teenage Christine was unable to resist. But he had a dark past of run-ins with the law and narcotics. There was something in his eyes, Lori described, and every time I saw him, it made me very uncomfortable. But Christine insisted she could change him. Nobody else would befriend him. Her parents were concerned, especially when she began spending less time with her friends and began distancing from her family. Chris and Christine's relationship wasn't perfect. The couple would often get into fights, resulting in Christine standing outside of his house all night screaming. According to Chris's sister Brandy, Christine once threatened to kill everyone in the family. Chris wasn't any better, allegedly pulling off his girlfriend's wig in front of other students to humiliate her. When Christine began participating in narcotics and getting in trouble for shoplifting, Lori's concern led to an attempt at a restraining order, but nothing could keep their lovesick daughter away from Chris. Tiffany and Rachel eventually graduated but stayed in touch with their high school friends. Tiffany inherited the family house after her father retired and moved away. She would throw parties with Rachel, her boyfriend Marcus Priscilla, and Marcus's cousin, Aldebert Sanchez. Little did they know, their last party would never happen. July 18th was hot and humid as most summer days were in Clear Lake. Police tape lined the fence on Tiffany's upper middle class home. The commotion Brittany made after Tiffany failed to pick up the phone had alerted neighbors. This never happened in the affluent neighborhood, let alone in the middle of the day. A statement released by Houston Police Department Homicide Division Officer Phil Yochum explained, I think it happened very quickly, but it was very, very violent. It looks like some type of confrontation happened at the front door, then moved into the living room. There were no signs of forced entry. It was a surprise attack. Over 40 bullets were fired, some littering the wall surrounding the four teens. Rachel was brutalized the most. One bullet had hit her bottom, suggesting she was attempting to flee. George Kalarudis, a large man, came running towards the door, tears running down his face. He received a call that something had happened at Tiffany Powell's house and he needed to make sure his daughter Rachel wasn't there. Begging cops to be let in, he was asked to stay put and wait. Eventually, Rachel's wallet was identified. I got to the end of the street and I didn't know what to do, which way to turn. Here's the big leader, the big man of the house, and I have no idea what I'm doing, where I'm going. Investigators were focused on the neighbors, the most likely to have seen or heard anything suspicious in the time leading up to the massacre. Some neighbors claimed to have heard a banging noise, but the police were looking for someone who had seen any suspects. Luckily, at 11.14 p.m., they came across a couple who had just gotten back from vacation in Mexico. When interviewed by police, they revealed having seen two people, a male and a female, walking up the driveway of the Raul house. The girl was described as white, about 18 to 25, 115 to 120 pounds, wearing all black and a bandana. The male was fair-skinned, thin, and around 18 to 20. The couple went downtown with investigators for a police sketch, a sketch that was so detailed that it revealed the suspects to a T. But it took a year before these sketches were released to the public. Knowing that Tiffany and Rachel had just graduated, police looked into their fellow students. Talking to potential suspects at Clear Lake High School only led to a dead end. Many thoughts ran through interrogators' heads. 
Who could have done it? Were the culprits hired professionals? Was this a drug deal gone wrong? What was clear to investigators was that there was total carnage. Two different caliber guns were used, so there were likely two perpetrators, and said perpetrators walked in and unleashed fire. This wasn't a robbery. The victims still had their money and jewelry on them. Out of the shots fired, only 17 had hit their intended targets. And what of their best friend? Christine, who learned the news when she got back from her shift at Walgreens, was devastated. She spent three days in her bed sobbing herself to sleep, Lori Palilla said in an interview with the New York Post. In the months leading up to the incident, Christine had slowly distanced herself from her friends, but still kept contact. She was even at Tiffany's birthday party the weekend before. Heartbroken, Christine couldn't bring herself to go to the funeral. It was too hard to fathom. Funerals always reminded her of her deceased father. Christine began spending more time with Chris and her grades suffered for it. The teen would get into fights with her parents over her behavior and run away often. Eventually, Christine attended graduation in 2004 without all of her credits with the intention of finishing during the summer. But that never happened. Now done with school, her narcotic problems spiraled out of control. She was admitted to a rehab facility in Centerpoint, Texas. Once the pain over losing his daughter Rachel subsided, George Kalarudis decided that he wasn't going to let the crime go by unnoticed. He called the lead investigator, Homicide Division Lieutenant Tom Ladd, often to receive updates and ensure the case was being investigated. George had his friend, Shane Murs, create a website that advertised reward money. Shane's company, MRE Consulting, even contributed money. Working with the HPD, they monitored the website for any reoccurring IP addresses that might be following the case. An account for the reward website was created as well, called the Rachel Colorudis Memorial Fund. Crime Stoppers also assisted in getting the word out. A few days before the press conference, a benefit concert was staged to honor the victims and bring awareness to the investigation. Jennifer Grassman, a friend of Rachel's, performed a song she wrote called White Roses. Police manned the phone lines, receiving many calls from tipsters claiming to have known one or more of the teens. Some claimed they knew someone who was with Marcus that day. Others said they saw Tiffany and Rachel at the club they worked at earlier in the day. Detective Brian Harris was assigned to the case under Tom Ladd, and together, they pulled up the phone records on Rachel's cell phone, revealing that she attempted to call 911 at 3.14 p.m., unable to press dial since she was probably already dead. Something didn't sit right with George. The sketches still weren't released to the public. According to the Homicide Division, the sketches could have been two people wandering the neighborhood, but George knew in his heart the sketches were more important than the police let on. He continued to press on. It wasn't until 2004 when Tom Ladd retired and Detective Brian Harris took over the case that the sketches were finally released. Billboards went up around Clear Lake announcing the reward and Crime Stoppers tip line. Brian was sure that he had already spoken to the killers and that the sketches were merely of bystanders, but because of George's insistence, he didn't want the public to perceive the homicide division as neglectful of the victim's families. A lot of work had been done on this case and it needed to be solved. The sooner, the better. Marcus's stepdad, David Gronewald, helped George in creating the billboard posters for the children and his employer was able to donate money towards the artwork. Clear Channel donated the space, providing 15 locations for billboards. In George's eyes, even if the two people in the sketches weren't the perpetrators, they may be the missing link to solving the murder once and for all. Seeing the sketches gave us some comfort, Nicole Sanchez, Aldebert's sister said. Police decided then to call everyone on the phone records in contact with victims the two days leading up to the crime but they missed the perpetrator by one day. More people called and left tips, but the investigation didn't move any further. But before they lost all hope, on July 28, 2005, 
Brian Harris answered the phone to a man who wished to remain anonymous. While partying, an inebriated man had confided in the tipster that he and his girlfriend had killed four people in Clear Lake and he needed to get this off his back. This man was Chris Snyder. The tipster didn't know the name of the girlfriend, but he knew that she and Chris went to the house with bandanas over their faces. The girlfriend had told Chris that the two men in the house had assaulted one of the girls, so he went over there to take care of things. The tipster had given Chris's birth date and last known address, along with the name of the girlfriend's father, Dick Thomas, and her phone number. Brian sat with the information for a little while, confused by the motive since it didn't add up with what they were working with. There were no phone records of a Chris Snyder or Christine, who was his girlfriend at the time and wasn't listed as a friend of the girls. The information was left untouched until 2006. Meanwhile, Christine was getting treatment at a rehabilitation center in Centerpoint, Texas. She was no longer in contact with her boyfriend, Chris Snyder, and had found a new love in Justin Rott, whom she had met at a 12-step meeting in 2004, sharing an interest in becoming sober. He was immediately taken by her beauty, but wasn't interested in her at first, being seven years older. But after getting to know her better, Justin found that they had a lot more in common. They began dating and were engaged by that Christmas. Running away together in March 2005, they got married. Now with the inheritance money from her father's passing, a whopping $360,000, Christine planned on purchasing a condo in Webster, Texas and turning her life around. But it was short-lived. While sitting in their condo, a news report came on about the two-year anniversary of the Clear Lake murders. Remembering her friends, Christine became nervous. The police sketches appeared on screen and she began to cry. Oh my goodness, does that look like me? Does that look like me? She asked her bewildered husband. Justin had to step back for a second, wondering if his newly wedded wife was involved. Around that time, Hurricane Katrina hit, adding to the stress and disarray. The couple was displaced to Arlington to stay with Justin's family, but all the stress led to a craving. Seeking narcotics, the couple drove to San Antonio. While on the road, Christine began having flashbacks about Rachel. Staring at the mirror, she would sometimes see her friend's face, using narcotics to dull the pain. Eventually, the guilt became too much to bear, and it was time to confess to her husband. During a binge in their hotel room, she confided, I thought maybe she knew of something that happened. I really didn't believe that she was involved in anything. You know, people say stories, and she was so vague about it all. And you know, I thought maybe something had happened to one of her friends and she knew something and she didn't go to the police," Justin recalled in a later interview. Christine relayed the events to her confused husband. Christine and Chris were driving to Tiffany's house intending to rob the teens. Before they entered the house, Chris stopped her and handed her a gun, saying he had taken it from his father. Perplexed, Christine didn't think much of the gesture and put the weapon in her purse. One of the girls answered the door while the others watched TV. Christine asked Tiffany to bring her to her room. Bursting into tears once inside, she apologized profusely and explained she was there to rob them. Meanwhile, in the other room, Chris warned, don't move. Tiffany burst out of her room. Why are you doing this? Marcus fell with a shot, pleading for his life. Startled, Alderbert stood up. Another shot echoed. Tears ran down Christine's face as she pulled the trigger herself. Loud bangs rang out until she couldn't think. No more ammo. The pair left the house and hopped into Christine's car. What had she done? Before starting the car, she remembered something. She ran back into the house and amidst the carnage spied Rachel, clinging to her life on the floor. She was crawling, trying to reach her phone. Her arm reached out as her red-stained fingers dialed 911. Sensing who she thought was her best friend's presence, Rachel spoke shakily. Why? Why would you? Christine took out her pistol as Rachel cried in agony. A last breath. No more sound. 
Christine jumped back into her car and sped off. At 4.23 p.m., she clocked in for her shift at Walgreens. She put on her work apron and washed up in the bathroom. Christine stood behind the makeup counter. Blood still stained her fingernails. July 8, 2006, 2.02 p.m. Ten days before the third anniversary of the event, Sergeant Eddie Diaz answered the phone. A male was on the other line. I overheard Christine Paulilla talking about the murders in Clear Lake back in July 03. Christine was in the Starlight Rehab in Center Point, Texas back in 04, and I was in the same facility. Have you ever killed anyone? Christine had asked him one day. No. I did, and it wasn't something I thought I would ever do. Christine explained how she and her boyfriend had committed the act. She was also friends with one of the girls who was killed. They had used two weapons, a 45 caliber and 9mm, retrieved from the boyfriend's father's safe and safely put back after the deed was done. Their plan was to rob the teens, but Christine felt uneasy about the ordeal. After the deed was done, the couple realized the amount of narcotics paraphernalia and money in the house was a lot smaller than they thought. Following this tipster's lead, Brian Harris looked up their names on the system. Lo and behold, Christine Paulilla and Christopher Snyder had been arrested together in October 2003. Again, a tipster called Crime Stoppers on July 14th. Officer Frank Poe answered and called over Brian to listen in. The scared caller was with Chris Snyder the week before at a nightclub, and after a couple of drinks, Chris admitted that he and his girlfriend Chrissy had killed four people a few years back in Clear Lake with a 9mm. With those names brought up once again, Brian pulled up the phone records to see that Christine had called Tiffany on July 14, 2003. On July 17, 2006, the day before the three-year anniversary, two arrest warrants for Christopher Snyder and Christine Paulilla were made. Their first stop was to the University of Houston, where Mother Lori Paulilla worked. Lori hadn't spoken to Christine since 2005, but had been texting her husband Justin every now and then. She was able to track the location of the ATM they were using and gave it to investigators. After checking banking and credit card statements, police were brought to a hotel in La Quinta, Texas. July 19, 2006, 12 p.m. Room 111, La Quinta Motel, San Antonio, Texas. Search warrant in hand, Brian and a tactical unit burst into the hotel room. What they found was disgusting. Paraphernalia littered the floor along with blood, vomit, dog feces, and junk food wrappers. In the corner, Christine stood, half naked, shaking, and crying. Through dog barks, police handcuffed the couple and led them to a patrol car. Christine and Justin had been holed up in their motel room living off Cheez-Its, soda, and Reese peanut butter cups, spending upwards of $500 a day on narcotics. Christine hadn't left the room in months, and Justin had only left to stock up on food and use the local ATM. With one culprit found, they still needed to track down Chris. HPD arrived at the Snyder residence on July 20th, 2006. Inside the house, they found the family safe along with the weapons, but Chris wasn't there. He had moved away with a girlfriend and was currently on the run. He had left his wallet, money and phone at his girlfriend's house and had taken a large amount of pills. Gathering police dogs, investigators began their manhunt, ending on August 5th in the woods behind his girlfriend's house. Lying on the ground, Chris had OD'd. The string of interrogations began with Justin Rott at 12.38 p.m. He readily spoke with investigators at the San Antonio Police Department, revealing the events Christine told him. By 2.45 p.m., Brian was ready to question Christine. She was sobering up and sobbing. A series of holes popped up in her story, but she was determined to implicate Chris and prove her innocence. According to Christine, it was all Chris's fault and she had no part in the homicide. She was in the car the entire time. 
Brian contradicted her story, saying she was spotted in Tiffany's driveway, and Christine changed her statement to claim she was considering telling her friends she had nothing to do with the robbery. Brian pressed for more details. Her posture told him she wasn't telling the entire story. Christine was pushed into a corner when Brian asked why Justin knew specific details about the murder. Your husband gives exact details of what happens, okay? Of exact details. Either he pours his heart out to you, all right, when you're leaving there, or you're there. Well, I, I, I had not been in that house. Okay. I was not in that house. Okay. At all. I Were you in the I driveway? I'll put anything on it. I was not in that house. When she claimed she had spoken with Chris and they were trying to put the blame on her, Brian presented her with more specifics. This included how Rachel was crawling towards her phone and the exact caliber of the weapons. She still fiend ignorance. Frustrated, Brian walked out of the room and asked Justin to demand his wife to tell the truth. When he came back to the room, Christine was quiet and shaking. All she could do was beg to go to the hospital. She was experiencing extreme withdrawal symptoms. Oh, I want to take you back to Houston with me so you can be closer to your mom. Do you understand? But I can't do that if you're all f***ed up and gonna pass out and all that other s***, okay? I just, I just need to see a nurse. Hmm? I just need to see a nurse. So if they like, take like, give me something or not, I'm not saying like, oh, give me I just... I'm, I feel sick right now, and if I could just see a nurse. The second interview didn't yield much more information, even when Brian lied to Christine and they told her that they had already spoken with Chris Snyder. Christine was still being treated, so they decided to wait. The next morning, Christine was signed out of the hospital and brought to the HPD headquarters. After a McDonald's Happy Meal, Detective Breck McDaniel took over the questioning and found another inconsistency. How did she know that Rachel was in the house if she didn't go inside? Christine changed her story once more to add that she did go up to the house and saw that Chris pulled out his gun. He then pushed the second one into her hand and all she remembered was that the weapons were both shooting bullets, but she didn't pull the trigger. It was violent when, the, when it goes off? Mm -hmm. How many times do you think it went off in your hand? A million times. It, it went off a bunch in your hand? It, it felt like a million times. Like Did, the, even like the first time, it felt like a million you, times. So you, you're pulling the trigger somehow? No, no. Like, it, it's like he has his hand, and my hand was like, I, I, I couldn't even tell you how, like, it was, it was, okay. but it, it was his force that was making, making the, it go off. Yes. Okay. She then claimed she was too scared to speak to Chris again. A false fact since the Snyder family alleged she wouldn't stop calling the house afterwards. When asked why she lied in the first place, Christine explained she was afraid Chris would go after her family. This was all enough evidence to get Christine convicted. In September of 2008, the trial began. The prosecution attorney Rob Freyer argued that Christine had without a doubt went into the home with the intention of murder and that her explanation of this crime was insulting to anybody's intelligence. As the gruesome photos from the crime scene were shown, Christine didn't make a sound or show any emotion, while others needed to leave the room. The trial ended on October 13, 2008, with the closing argument saying that Chris Snyder alone wasn't to blame. Christine Paulilla was sentenced to life for the murder of four teenagers, two of whom were her best friends, with the eligibility of parole in 40 years. She was denied the death penalty since she was underage at the time of the crime. When he finished his book, Never See Them Again, that describes the events, M. William Phelps asked George if there was closure. Through tears, the father explained, Closure? There's no closure, and there never will be. My little girl was going through hell during her last moments while wondering, looking at her friend, why a friend of hers would do this. She was scared, and I'm sure she was calling my name out. Losing a child is never easy, and the pain and hardship the victim's families endured may never be forgotten. As George Kalarudis concluded later on, closure is not something you're seeking. 
What would possess someone to kill their friends? According to psychiatrist Gail Saltz, there would be key moments in Christine Paulilla's early life that constructed her twisted mind, losing her father at an early age, developing alopecia, losing her mother to the system, and being ostracized from her peers are some traumatic moments. Falling in love with her tormentor, Chris Snyder, is another one. Specifically, targeting her friends may have been because there was a chance she thought they were pitying her, Gail said in an interview with ABC. That's going to create some intense envy and jealousy, bring out the aggression, and wish to punish them for what they have. For more Twisted Stories, please subscribe.